And today we have come here to observe the Lord's Supper. And uh, today begins what we call Passion Week. And Passion Week was the day that Jesus uh, came into town to Jerusalem. And all the people there were uh, praising Him and singing and throwing palm branches. And uh, something that I want you to consider doing this week, I'm going to do this myself. Uh, I'm going to start in Mark chapter 11 tomorrow, and it's the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ. And each day, uh, I am going to read a chapter, chapter 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 would be on Saturday. And I believe that will prepare our hearts for next Sunday. And so we praise the Lord uh, for that. So if you would just please pray and consider doing that as a church and we will all be on the uh, same page. And the other thing I want to share with you before I get started is uh, every Saturday night from 6 to 9, uh, that's my... Uh, it's my study time. And uh, as I was thinking about the Lord's Supper, I just want you to know I want to start off just saying that I rededicated my life to Christ. People think, I, I don't know, or people think that sometimes we as pastors have it all together. And I assure you folks, we have temptations just like you do. We hurt just like you do. We need to do business with God just like you do. So I want to say right off the bat, my only purpose here today is to glorify God in Jesus and to get your heart ready for the Lord's Supper. Amen. Because it's so important that we prepare ourselves. And so I'm going to ask you for the next few minutes just to totally focus on the Scripture that we are talking about, to total, totally focus on God and on Jesus. And also, I want you to focus on the cross. On the cross. Folks, I am telling you, no greater love as man than this that a man gives his life for another. And Jesus literally gave his life for you and for I. We have come here today to celebrate two events in the life of Jesus. First is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is one week before the resurrection uh, and Easter Sunday on your calendar. Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem that day, and people threw pro, uh, uh, palm branches and, and glorified God by singing. Figuratively, palm branches were symbolic of the righteousness of God and was used as a symbol of victory for kings. The second event that we will be celebrating today is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a reminder of how, of how much God truly loves us and the blessings he bestows on us through the pardoning of sin. Jesus' body was broken. His blood was shed for salvation. We can never repay the Lord for the high price that was paid for our redemption. The greatest two concerns I have about the Lord's Supper is first the concern of routine. Just going through the motions and taking it too lightly. And I do not want to ever be accused of that. And the second concern of mine is a lack of total honesty before the Lord. In our scripture text, Paul cuts to the very heart of these two issues in the Corinthian church. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we will begin in verse 17. There is an outline in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along with us. The Lord's Supper, let me give you the outline. Number one, an honest evaluation. An honest evaluation. Folks, we need to evaluate our spiritual life. We need to evaluate where we are with God. We don't need to put on masks. We don't want to uh, sidestep the issue. We need an honest evaluation. Number two, an honest examination. An examination. And it's what I call the x-ray of life. Okay? Not just an evaluation, but the x-ray and the examination sees inside of you. 
the part that nobody else sees. God looks at the heart, folks. And in all of life, all of issues begin in the heart. And it is so important that we have a clean heart. We are not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Everyone sins. Everyone needs Jesus Christ. Everyone needs to confess their sins uh, before God. But, we, but what we don't like to do, we can do the evaluation, but the examination really points you know, to the issues that we have in life and things that God is trying to get out of your life so you can have that joy, so that you can have that victory, so that you can be that bold witness in what you are doing. Number three, an honest expectation. An honest expectation. And folks, I, I'm just telling you right now, uh, I am expecting Jesus to come any time now. We have been looking through the book of Revelation, and the next thing I believe on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And when that happens, man, we are out of here, folks. And praise God for that. An honest evaluation. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. And again, Paul is... is talking to the church at Corinth, he has heard some of the things that is going on there. And the model for the Lord's Supper, obviously, is Jesus and, you know, his disciples. That, that first Passover supper, uh, that, that time that he had with his disciples, which we'll be sharing here in a minute. But he is saying, I praise you not, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worst. So there was some issues going on in the Corinthian church that Paul felt like he needed to address. Verse 18, first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Folks, you, you need to know this. I've said this many times. God unites, Satan divides. And folks, the reason God cannot work in some churches is because of division. I've heard all kinds of stories throughout my life. I have heard of all kinds of, of business meetings that took place. And in listening to these, I am telling you God is not in these things because of division. Folks, we are all a part of the body of Christ. We all need to be in one accord. It's not that we agree on everything. Okay, but the doctrines, the word of God, all these things, we do not need to let things divide us as a body of Christ. And Paul is saying this is happening in the church. Verse 19, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Factions are more than just divisions. Factions is little groups. Okay, and it's just like this. Uh, when when I was in youth ministry, I am telling you the biggest problem I had in youth ministry were cliques. Okay, now adults, I'm just telling you, you are no different than than youth. Adults also have little cliques, people that they hang around with, and I'm I'm not saying it's wrong to have a group of people, but what was happening here was. They were excluding people that weren't maybe going to the church all the time or maybe not attending all the time or maybe they were poor or maybe they didn't have things uh, that other people had. And folks, I am telling you, divisions and factions, the Holy Spirit will have much trouble working in a situation like that. That's what Paul is saying. And notice the second part of that those who are approved may be recognized among you. There are, even in this church, outstanding Christians. There are outstanding people walking with the Lord. It isn't that they were more spiritual, but they were not practicing these things that other people were practicing. And I've told you many times, according to the Word of God, everyone should be welcome at Rye Hill Baptist Church. 
I don't care what color you are. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care where you've come from, your nationality, your language, nothing. You are welcomed here at Rye Hill Baptist Church. And we will embrace you. We will love on you. And folks, we must do this. We must do this. Verse 20, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And when you think about it, even the example that Jesus had, usually, and even in the Acts chapter 2 church, all right, what they would do is they would normally begin with what we call a potluck supper. And that's where us Baptists, that, I'm just telling you, we have a PhD in potluck suppers. What are we doing after church? We're eating. And there's nothing wrong with eating. All right, nothing wrong with it. But look at what happened. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the other. One is hungry and another is drunk. Are you kidding me? What in the world do they think? What are they thinking here? And what they do, did, they would come early, some of them, and they would get at their little table. And they would just talk to the people around them. And they would just share food with their little crowd. And then if a guest came in, or even a poor person that may have just had, like, brought some soup because they couldn't afford meat, they would just ignore those people and do their own thing. Faction and division. One is hungry and another is drunk. And again, I'm not getting in on the wine and the... You know, all that, folks, in those days, you know, there just was not pure water. There, it just was there. Uh, that was a, a, a drink of choice in that time. And I'm just simply saying, we should not. We, it, it's part of our covenant, folks, to abstain from alcohol. Okay, and we certainly should not get drunk in what we, what, what we are doing. Verse 22, what? Have you houses to eat and drink in? Or de despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? I shall not praise you in this. I will not praise you. And so they would have what they called the love feast first, where they would have the dinner. And again, there was just so much going on, factions and div divisions and all this. And then they would partake of the Lord's Supper. Today, we're just doing it opposite. The order really doesn't matter. Folks, what matters is the heart. What matters is loving one another equally. What matters is pleasing God in everything we do. What matters is the cross of Jesus Christ. What matters is what Jesus went through. I don't think we can wrap our head around what Jesus went through. I am telling you folks, uh, oh, what's the movie, The Passion of the Christ? I used to watch it every Easter season. But when it became so real to me, I am telling you, when I watch it nowadays, I just sit there and bawl through the movie of what he truly went through. And Paul is saying, are you kidding me? These things go together, and you're making a mockery of one of those things. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25, just go down and look at that. 12, 25. That there should be no schisms in the body that they, and that the members should have the same care one for the other. And just think about uh, you know, the divisions that we have. And, and again, not, not, not in a negative way first. I'm simply saying we have a preschool, we have a children's, we have a youth, and we have an adult division. Okay? And I'm telling you, not one ministry is important than the other one. They're all the same. They all have meaning and purpose. All right? There's, there's no rivalries. There's no, you know, uh, you know, pitting one against the other. That's what unity is. It's just like our staff. I love our staff because we genuinely love one another. If, if one is having an event, just like Saturday, having an event out there and we have our big Easter egg hunt, I'm telling you, our whole staff will be there helping in the children's area. And that is the way it's supposed to be, folks. 
Verse 26, and if one member suffer, all the members should suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members shall rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Folks, when somebody gets a raise, we ought to just say, hey man, I am so glad you got a raise. They get a new car. And I have heard this, not here. I heard this in Lawton, Oklahoma. There's out in the vestibule talking that I heard. Someone says, I got a new car. They walk away, and a man said this, if I didn't tithe, I could get me a new car also. I was youth minister, and I was floored. I was floored. Man, folks, we ought to love one another. We ought to rejoice with one another. We ought to weep when someone is hurting, when somebody lose somebody close to them. We need to be weeping with them. We need to be caring about them. We need to show the love of God in all that we do. Folks, I am telling you, Paul just was saying it like it is. Paul was saying, this should not be. So we see an honest evaluation. The second thing I see is an honest examination. Look down in verse 27. An honest e e uh, examination. Therefore, uh, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And he's simply saying, you do not need to take this lightly today. You need to be serious, okay? You need to be serious about that. And, and you know, folks, we're talking about, again, you know, the, the bread is, is Jesus' body, okay? Man, when I look at, again, the, the movie and I see the, the beating of the cat of nine tails and uh, you know what that whip was made of with glass and bones and things that and and literally you know seeing him beat nearly to death i'm just telling you i'll never forget ever 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 forget this we did the jesus film with first baptist church in Almond. we went down to juarez and we went to mexico city and we would show that uh jesus film and one time we were showing and and it showed the beating of christ this lady, which I really didn't understand, you know, uh, Spanish there, all right? I got some of it the longer I went down there. But when it comes to that beating, this lady just started screaming in Spanish. And I asked the missionary, what is she saying? She was saying, stop the film, stop the film. Somebody needs to help this man. And my heart just broke, tears just come down my face. Folks, it was real. It was real. His beating was real. Men died from those beatings. And Jesus' body was broken and His blood was spilled for us. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself. And you know what we do in America? We don't like to examine ourselves. We like to examine others. Well, I'm not as bad as this dude. Well, I know something on him. He doesn't have anything on me. And folks, my grandma always said, when you're pointing at somebody, there's three looking right back at you. You know who that three is? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Folks, we need to examine ourselves. doesn't matter what somebody else is doing. We're talking about your walk with Christ. We're talking about your relationship with Christ today. So let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks uh, judgment to himself and not discerning the Lord's body. Folks, the key here is we all have sin in our lives. We all do wrong things. Unworthy is not, unworthy is making peace with sin. 
Unworthy is justifying sin. Unworthy is comparing ourselves to others. When we pray, when we have an invitation, I pray that you are only looking at your life and no one else's. I pray that you are doing business with God, not just singing in Him. And I know why we sing. I understand that. But this is too important to ignore. And I know other, the other side of that coin is, well, I'm unworthy. I'm not. Well, folks, I got news for you. You'll never be worthy. Ever. But we are forgiven. We are forgiven. And we need to be right with God when we take the Lord's Supper. That's what He is saying. Verse 30, And for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Folks, God does discipline His children. He really does. And I'm not saying every time somebody gets sick, they, they're not right with God. I mean, even in my sickness, I, I, you know, it was, it was a year long. And I just kept asking God and asking God. And to this day, I don't know why it took a year. All I know was I was, as far as I could tell, I was in the will of God. And it was His will for me to be that way. And now I'm telling you, this morning, I took my pulse ox. It was 99 today, which is the highest it's been. It's been. Sickness and also sleep. I'm telling you, uh, can I mention Ananias and Sapphira? Revival had broke out in the church. They were given land and they were given monies. And they walked in church and lied to the Holy Spirit. You're on dangerous ground, folks, when you start lying to the Holy Spirit. And God took them out of there. I mean, they carried them out. All right, he, he went first, and she comes in and starts lying too. Carried them out. So it's a serious thing, folks. A serious thing. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Folks, we're all going to be judged. And really, in some ways, life is unfair down here. People are going to lie to you. People are going to talk about you. People are going to do things to upset you. But you can't let that get in between you and God and your walk with God. My job is not to please 700 people in this church. I cannot please 700 people. In, it's impossible. My job is to connect with God to say, thus saith the Lord, and make sure when I get up here, not that I'm perfect, but that I am prayed up and right with God. That's my job. And folks, this other stuff, honestly, I'm getting to the ages. I really don't care what people think about me. If you don't know me by now, that's your problem, not mine. Man, I'm doing my best to serve the Lord. And folks, we, are, we as Christians sometimes, man, we're good at that. We're good at that. Keep your eyes on yourself. The Lord will judge. Verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we will not be condemned by the world. And folks, there are some times God is chastening us and trying to get our attention. Why? So that we would live a good life and be an example to others that follow us. Folks, I don't want to in any way imply that we, we can be perfect. We're not. But don't be satisfied with the status quo. We're not perfect, but we should strive for, for perfection. And do you know how to strive for, for perfection? Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Try to please God in everything you do. Psalm 139. I'm almost through. Psalm 139. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Why do policemen search people? Because they may have something illegal on them. Why does God search us? Because there could be sin in our life that we have made peace with. It's in God's Word. We know we shouldn't be doing it, but we're doing it anyway. Man, I think the hardest thing for a true Christian to do is look in the mirror 
I mean, most every one of you getting dressed today looked in the mirror. And we see what we think we see sometimes. But God sees who we truly are. And it is hard to walk up to that mirror and say, God, I want to be totally honest with you. I want you to be totally honest with me. What do you see? What do you see? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxiety. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Oh, folks, we all need to go in that examination room. We all need to do business with God. We all need to be x-rayed that we're in God. And, and folks, He knows what we think. He knows what's inside our heart. He knows our motives. He knows our attitudes. And folks, we can lie to others, but we cannot lie to God. And really, one of the worst kinds of lies, according to the Word of God, is lying to yourself. And folks, I know people, I know people that lie so much that they begin to believe their own lies. And folks, don't live like that. Come clean. Be honest. Do an x-ray. Do an examination. Ask God, is there anything in my life? And I brought, I brought this up, Scott, last night at our prayer time when we pray right down here. And I asked the question to the group, what do you think would happen if everyone that walked in these doors today was right with God? Number one, you wouldn't be worried about how much time's on the clock. Number two, you wouldn't be looking around Saying when somebody walks down the aisle, wonder what they did. Number three, you'd be so focused on God that that's all that really mattered. And number four, we would spend more time in invitation than we would in the preaching of the word. Folks, I've been in services like that. I've been in services where I could literally hear people weeping over sin. It's been a long time. But I've been in services where this altar's so full, somebody would have to go somewhere else because they couldn't kneel at the altar. Not here, but I've seen it, folks. And that's what search me, me. All right? Some people call it a come to Jesus meeting. Call it what it, some people call it revival. But my heart's desire, what I prayed last night and what I prayed this morning, that we would all be right with God when we begin the Lord's Supper. So we see an honest evaluation. We see an honest e examination. And we see an honest expectation. Look at verse 26. Back in our text. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until... He comes. It's a reminder of what is to come. Can I tell you, Christian, the best is yet to come. I mean, we've had some major blessings in our life. Folks, it's a blessing to be debt-free, to pay off a $3.6 million building in eight months. That is a blessing from God. We have freedoms in the United States that other countries do not have. I can walk out, I can go down on Garrison Avenue, and as long as I don't cause a disturbance, I can preach right there and not be bothered by that. We have freedom of speech. We have so many freedoms. Folks, we are blessed by God. We are blessed. And that's what he's saying. Remember that Jesus is coming again. And do you know what it will produce in your life? I wrote these down. Number one, joy. Joy. He has triumphed over death. All right? He has triumphed. An honest expectation. Looking for Christ to come. Peace. Our sins have been forgiven. And we know the Prince of Peace. Purpose in our life. We have a purpose. 
We are His ambassadors. We are His representation here on earth. Trust. Trust. We trust God in salvation, and we know that He is coming again. And trust produces confidence. Love. His love is inside of us, and we can love others unconditionally. And the last word is hope. Not a hope so salvation. Hope is knowing in our heart of heart, Jesus is coming again. John 14, John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Folks, we're going, it's not a cabin in the woods. I don't care who wrote it. It's a mansion, all right? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Hey, man, Jesus was a carpenter. He was a carpenter. Man, he'll outbuild anyone here on earth. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. That is a promise, a promise from God. You can take it to the bank and receive you to myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Wow. Wow. Promise from God. Folks, we have so much to be thankful for this day. I am thankful for creation. I am thankful for the forgiveness of sin. I am thankful for the blood of Jesus. I am thankful for the body of Jesus that was broken for me. I am thank you that we have hope and we have eternal salvation forever and ever and ever. You're here today and don't know Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Folks, it's Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. If you're here today and don't know Jesus Christ, I am testified and many, 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 many others would testify it's the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for the instructions that we have from your word. God, I pray that we would do business with you this day. God, I pray if there's those that need to come to these altars and pray, that they would just step out. I pray if there's those here that need to rededicate their life, that they would do that, God. I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you and needs to be saved, I pray that would take place also. And God, this is your church. This is your invitation. We're preparing our hearts for the Lord's Supper. So God, I pray there would be repentance in this sanctuary. I pray there would be focus in this sanctuary. God, I pray that we would be right with you before we partake of the Lord's Supper. God, we love you. We thank you. We give you the credit and we give you the glory for anything you choose to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? Mm -hmm.